Good afternoon. I'm Brett Kavanaugh of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Welcome to the Federalist Society panel on religious liberty and the limits of government power. Thanks to the Federalist Society for yet another spectacular National Lawyers Convention and for hosting this panel. And thank you all for being here. Here's how we'll do this. I will briefly introduce our panelists in the order they'll speak. They will each give presentations. We'll have some response time where they respond to what they've heard from the others. And then we'll take questions from the audience. Michael McConnell is the Richard and Francis Mallory Professor and Director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. He was, of course, an extraordinarily distinguished judge on the Tenth Circuit for many years before he took the position at Stanford this year. He previously was a professor at the University of Utah and the University of Chicago. He's frequently taught as a visiting professor at Harvard. Both Judge McConnell and I teach classes at Harvard Law School during the winter term, and I look forward to seeing him again in the beautiful Cambridge weather this coming January. Judge McConnell has written numerous influential articles on a variety of topics, as you all know, including, as relevant for today, the religion clauses of the First Amendment. He's argued 11 cases in the Supreme Court and was a clerk to Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court. Chip Lupu has been on the faculty at George Washington University Law School since 1990. After graduating from Harvard, he practiced law with the Boston firm of Hill and Barlow and then joined the law faculty at Boston University, where he taught from 1973 to 1989. Professor, Professor Lupu is a nationally recognized scholar in constitutional law with an emphasis in his writings on the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Along with his colleague, Robert Tuttle, he is the co-director of the Project on Law and Religious Institutions. We're honored he could join us today. Alan Brownstein is a professor of law at UC Davis School of Law, where he holds the Buchiever and Bird Chair for the study and teaching of freedom and equality. The primary focus of his scholarship as well relates to church-state issues and free exercise and establishment clause doctrine. His articles have been published in numerous academic journals, and he is the editor of the Establishment of Religion Clause, its Constitutional History in the Contemporary Debate, and he's co-author of Global Issues in Freedom of Speech and Religion. A graduate of Harvard Law School, Professor Brownstein was an attorney in private practice in Los Angeles before joining the UC Davis Law Faculty. We're pleased he's here with us today and look forward to his remarks as well. The First Amendment states in relevant part, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. At its core, the free exercise clause protects freedom of worship and belief. The government cannot penalize people because of their religious affiliations or beliefs. Government can, however, prohibit certain harmful actions, even if they are religiously motivated. The Establishment Clause has been understood to prohibit government establishment of religion, government coercion to support or participate in religion or its exercise, and at times even government endorsement of religion. Understanding the scope of the religion clauses and the relationship between the two clauses has confounded courts and scholars throughout our history. We look forward to our panel helping us improve that understanding today. Judge McConnell, the floor is yours. So thank you, Judge Kavanaugh, for that uh, introduction. And I just want to say before I begin what a pleasure it is to be uh, uh, back in the academy and especially to be speaking on a panel with two uh, 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 old friends of uh, of mine, and uh, and we've been uh, when we were just reminiscing about the various panels and conferences that we've been to on sub various subjects in church and state over uh, uh, I would guess uh, 15, 20 years now, and it's uh, very nice to be uh, appearing with these two uh, uh, gentlemen. Uh, subject that I'm going to uh, address as part of uh, this uh, afternoon's uh, uh, panel uh, has to do with the. Uh, 
a conventional wisdom that liberal democracy required secularization as part of its uh, uh, cultural background, that it was necessary in order to have liberal pluralistic democracy that, uh, that we in the West break away from the more religious worldviews that were characteristic of uh, pre-modern uh, uh, feudalism, aristocracy, and monarchy, and that our establishment clause of the First Amendment and the various disestablishments at the state level were the legal embodiment of that movement toward a secularization of our uh, public culture. Uh, I'm going to suggest that that is, in fact, not uh, historically or constitutionally uh, uh, what First Amendment uh, at the national level or disestablishment at the state level uh, was about, that rather uh, it was about preventing the government from exercising control over this particular important institution for the formation of public opinion. And thus that the Establishment Clause is more akin to the Free Press Clause, uh, to free enterprise and to limited government more generally rather than to any kind of very specific anti-religious or secularization uh, uh, impulse. I want to talk about this in three different ways. Uh, uh, first, in terms of the approach of the founders uh, to the governmental role in the formation of public opinion, because they had a distinct view of republicanism under which the government was going to be controlled by public opinion, public opinion was not going to be controlled by the government. Thus, I would suggest, again, that the Establishment Clause should be seen as a close sort of kissing cousin uh, to the Free Press Clause, both of these clauses of the, um, of the First Amendment being designed to prevent the government from being able to, to, uh, to control these institutions for uh, sharing of opinion and the formation of, uh, uh, of ideas. Um, uh, in, 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 in looking at this, it's important to understand what establishment of religion was really all about. Uh, we often think of this in terms of theocracy, that is gov re religious control over the government and thinking that disestablishment is aimed at theocracy. Uh, but the established church was really the other way around. It was not a theocracy. It was the theological term Erastianism, that is government control over the church for the government's own purposes. What was the established Church of England uh, under the, uh, under the uh, prior regime? Well, it was constituted by principally by the Act of Supremacy, which made the King or Queen of England the supreme head of the church uh, and responsible for uh, uh, naming all of the high prelates and maintaining orthodoxy within the church was also constituted uh, by a set of parliamentary enactments which created liturgy and creed so that the uh, King James Bible, that's the, if you look at your title page on the King's, King James Bible, you'll see that the actual title of this is the authorized version. Well, who authorized it? Answer, Parliament authorized the authorized version. The uh, Book of Common Prayer adapt, adapted adopted by vote of parliament. The 39 Articles of Faith of the Church of England adopted by vote of parliament. One of which, by the way, uh, was uh, that the uh, monarch, the king or king queen of England, is supreme in all matters, both religious and civil. A very convenient uh, creed uh, a very convenient tenant of the faith if you happen to be uh, uh, the monarch of, uh, of Great Britain. Uh, and so the church was thoroughly under the control of the state, and the state was not at all hesitant to use the church as an instrument, a supplementary in instrument of social control, to try to encourage, to inculcate the idea uh, that good Christian uh, members, good men, subjects of the king would be uh, obedient uh, to the king, would not engage in rebellion, would not engage in resistance, but rather would be good monarchical uh, citizens. Uh, well, on this side of the Atlantic, uh, we uh, were not so keen on that, 
That is why the Church of England was disestablished in every state where it was the established church. And by the way, it was established everywhere south of Pennsylvania, plus in the four co uh, counties of metropolitan New York. So, and, and when I say established, I do not mean established in some metaphorical sense, you know, as in you know, having nativity scenes or, uh, uh, or, uh, or, or crosses in remote places in the Mojave Desert. Uh, <laughs> By establishment, what I mean is that people were actually taxed for the support of the church, that the laws required church attendance. This was so in about eight and a half of the 13 American colonies had that kind of a system. Plus in Virginia and a few of the other southern states, uh, the government had control over who were the ministers uh, and people who were not properly licensed from the state to, uh, uh, as clergy but performed that function uh, found themselves imprisoned. Uh, this is the kind of establishment that we're talking about. Uh, and it ended with the revolution. Not, I would like to emphasize, because there was any particular principled objection to the establishment of religion, although there was a little bit of that, but it was disestablished principally because this was the church which proclaimed the divine status of obedience to the king of England, and that was not the kind of church that we could have in revolutionary uh, America. 